Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Branches of Wisdom, the Banyan Books podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee, and I'm very excited about our guest today, Lon Milo Duquette. Before we get to his formal introduction, Banyan Books acknowledges that although we have people joining us from all over the world for these live streaming events, the physical location of Banyan Books and Sound in Vancouver, BC is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Now our guest today, Lon Milo Duquette, is a best-selling author and lecturer whose extensive books on magic, tarot, and the Western mystery traditions have been translated into 10 languages. He is currently the U.S. Deputy Grand Master of Ordo Templi Orientis and is on the faculty of the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York, and the Maybe Logic Academy. Among his many books are My Life with the Spirits, Understanding Aleister Crowley's Thoth Tarot, and the Tarot of Ceremonial Magic. And here's something else about our guest. He's an award-winning songwriter and a seasoned entertainer whose music performance experience spans four decades and includes touring with Arlo Guthrie and Johnny Rivers and even opening for Sammy Davis Jr. Today, Lon Milo Duquette is with Banyan Books in conversation about the newest edition of his now classic book, The Magic of Aleister Crowley, a handbook of the rituals of Thelema. Originally titled The Magic of Thelema, this classic guide is the perfect introductory text for readers who are drawn to Crowley's work rather than the myths and controversies that surround him. Step by step and in plain English, Duquette presents a course of study with examples of rituals and explanations of their significance. If you'd like to learn more about today's honored guest, you can find him on Facebook by searching his name, Lon Milo Duquette. Banyan Books community, please join me in a very warm welcome for Lon Milo Duquette. Well, thank you very much. And when you uh, flashed a picture of uh, uh, Banyan Books on on the intro there, I recognized it. I've I've done a, a book event there, uh, it, maybe ten years ago, but uh, uh, it was one of the last times I was in Vancouver. So I feel like I'm just coming back to back to the shop. A homecoming. A homecoming. <laughs> so great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Well, it's it's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. So. I guess the, the first question I, I have for you, and I, I just want to remind our live audience that uh, Lon is going to take uh, some of your uh, questions as well. So go ahead and type those into the, uh, the comments or chat on YouTube, and we'll get to as many of those as we can towards the end of the conversation. I guess the first question I have for you is maybe you can tell us what it is about Crowley's work that you love and value so much that you would dedicate so much of your life to studying and writing extensively about it? Uh, well, first of all, I get a kick out of the guy. He, uh, he was 
an incredible personality. Uh, at uh, you know, he had a terrible reputation, uh, and uh, I first uh, got introduced to him uh, through the the Thoth Tarot. Uh, this about 1971, 72. I bought the. I was interested in tarot, and uh, I bought the Thoth. T tarot deck and uh, it uh, uh, it was just absolutely fascinating it, it was so beautiful that it almost scared me you know like uh, like when uh, uh, oh the, the the great violinist Paganini played violins so well that that they said no human can can play that good it must be the devil you know <laughs> and uh, and Paganini took advantage of that, and you know, showed up in hearses and things like that, and and uh, black capes, and you know, yes, they had, uh, demonic possession here. Uh, Crowley was sort of like like that, and the Thoth Tarot was so beautiful. I thought, oh, it's so beautiful and occult. Is it must be spooky. And then I looked up Crowley's name in uh, a little occult dictionary that I that I bought at the supermarket of all places, and, and uh, it said uh, Alistair Crowley, famous Scottish Satanist. And I said, "Whoa, God, I'm right. The devil painted these cars." But eventually, okay, eventually I, I, I got a, a, an old edition of uh, the Book of Thoth, the, the book that, that Crowley wrote toward the end of his life to explain the cards. And 99% of it went completely over my head. But that 1% that I, that I did get, I knew this guy was not only absolutely brilliant, but he was funny, okay? And he was, he, uh, uh, he, he, I wouldn't call him whimsical, but uh, you, could, you could tell that his, his sense of humor was, was so keen and that he, I could see where people were freaked out ab about him, but it seemed like he was enjoying freaking out the freak outable and getting a kick out of that. And uh, the more I read Crowley, the, the more, uh, uh, the more interesting he became. And then I realized everything that I was trying to uh, uh, get into uh, as far as the Western Hermetic and the Western mysteries uh, Crowley seemed to know more about the subjects that I wanted to, to get into than anything that I'd read anywhere. And I figured, well, I'm, if I'm going to continue to, uh, uh, with this kind of study, I'm going to have to, have to get to know this guy. Uh, he died before I was born, uh, but I get to know his work. And so that's, uh, uh, that's sort of it. And the more, uh, the more I find out about him, and of course there's disturbing things, uh, uh, there's disturbing things about anybody's life, but for the most part as a spiritual, uh, authority and as a hardcore, sincere, uh, I don't want to use the word seeker, but a spiritual adventure maybe is a better uh, way to put it. And someone who is absolutely serious about expanding their own mind to the degree of, uh, of uh, what we could loosely call union with Godhead. Uh, Crowley sort of said it in a language that I could understand and appreciate and uh, and work with. So he he supplied me a vocabulary to explain things to myself. Does that make any sense? 
Makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I, I think you actually met some of his direct students and, and conversed and, and learned from them, no? Yes. Um, and, and again, just like everything else in my life, it's just pure luck. I just fell into to uh, uh, fell into this uh, uh, early on. I, I I answered the or I wrote the address, the post office box address on the Thoth Tarot, the promotional card on the Thoth Tarot. Now we're talking uh, mid seventies, uh, and. Uh, it was uh, Crowley's Ordo Templi Orientis. Uh, where is it? Well, I, and uh, because I figured, well, this Ordo Templi Orientis knows, uh, uh, really knows more about this stuff. I, I want to contact them and study with them. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but the, as an organization, it had almost gone totally extinct since Crowley's death. And it was just a couple old contemporaries of Crowley, uh, uh, Grady McMurtry and Phyllis Seckler. Uh, McMurtry, they were married at the time, uh, up here in the, almost in this neighborhood here in Dublin, California. And uh, uh, they were just in the process of kind of resurrecting uh, the activities of, of Ordo Templi Orientis, and uh, both of them being students. Uh, Grady actually studied with Crowley in England during World War II. Uh, he was uh, uh, at the time a lieutenant and then a major in the U.S. Uh, Army and was uh, involved in the invasion of uh, uh, France on D-Day. And uh, uh, in uh, the the months and weeks uh, preparing for that, he would jump in a jeep because he was a lieutenant. He could get a jeep, and he would go visit Crowley uh, at his uh, uh, where he was staying first in London at ninety three German Street, and then uh, at Bell Ashton. And uh, so, yes, these guys knew Crowley. They communicated with Crowley. They were uh, Grady was initiated by Crowley, and uh, magical initiation is kind of a personal thing, at least in, uh, especially in those days when there wasn't real live, big organized organizations to do formal initiations. Uh, uh, people of certain degrees could personally initiate uh, uh, others, and. Uh, so after writing a few letters uh, back and forth over about a two-year period from like 1973 to 1975, they finally thought that, well, this Duquette guy sounds like a nut, but he sounds like a harmless nut. And uh, so they scheduled me to be initiated, to take an initiation into the Crowley's... Uh, Ordo Templi Orientis. And at the time, I didn't know that uh, <laughs> I think I was only the second or third person that they'd done that, uh, uh, done that to uh, once they decided that they were going to try to, uh, you know, uh, resurrect the order. And um, then I was, uh, through them, I was introduced to uh, uh, Israel Regarde. Uh, who lived pretty close to me down in Southern California. Uh, he lived in Studio City. And uh, Israel Regarde was uh, the uh, secretary to Aleister Crowley in the 1920s and had been uh, with uh, trapes around Europe with, uh, with Crowley uh, being, his, uh, being his secretary. And... Um, uh, his scribe, if you will. So I was lucky enough. And then uh, through them, I also uh, uh, was uh, aiding Phyllis and Grady with my initiations. 
uh, early ones, uh, first degree initiations OTO wise, uh, was Helen Parsons Smith, who was the widow of both Jack Parsons, who uh, was uh, uh, a rocket a rocket engineer. Uh, I, there was, I think there was a recently a series. Netflix or HBO or something like that, uh, called Strange Angel, uh, which is sort of a fictionalized uh, version of, of Jack Parsons' life. Uh, there, there's a crater on the moon named after him. He was one of the founders of uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Rockadyne. And he was also a disciple of Aleister Crowley. And uh, so that was Helen Smith, uh, or Helen Parsons Smith, uh, and the Smith she was married to was Wilfred Smith, who was the master of the uh, uh, only active lodge of the OTO in the world. And uh, you might find this interesting, that Wilfred Smith was originally from Vancouver. And uh, the, the, uh, the, there was a going OTO in Vancouver before he moved down to uh, 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 the... the L.A. Hollywood area. So I fell in quite by accident. And six months after I took my initiation, my wife, Constance, also uh, uh, was initiated. And we've been active in, in the OTO uh, ever since. But it was a, it was a magical luxury to be able to talk to these people, to ask them questions that they could immediately answer to put your mind at ease or to stimulate your, uh, your uh, understanding of Crowley. Because when you hear things like, oh, Crowley killed and ate 120 babies one year. He says it right here in this book, okay? And it was such a luxury to be able to go, hey, did Crowley kill and eat <laughs> 120 babies one year? And to have, to, to look somebody in the eye and have them go, that's, no, that's the stupidest thing in the world, you know? What he was talking about is that, uh, one year in his diaries, he noted that, because uh, Crowley noted everything in his diaries, uh, he noted that he had uh, uh, ejaculated 120 times that year without making his partner pregnant. That's his child sacrifice. Now do you see why Crowley enjoyed freaking out the freak outable. Because if you're naive enough, if you're scared enough, if you're stupid enough to think that uh, here's a guy, a brilliant scholar, lived to be 70 some years old, never been arrested for anything, when he says he killed an eight. <laughs> 120 babies one year he's probably having you on but and and, and you really you really get into you say he clothed many of his teachings in a thin veil of sensational titillation there are reasons why he presented these things in different language aside from i know that the shock value was part of that so maybe you can tell us the, the there's multi-pronged reasons why he clothed his his teachings in that way, right? He knew, and it, he more or less comes right out and, and says this uh, in uh, various places. He knew that what he was an expert in uh, was not ever going to be generally popular or generally understood. It was, it was uh, uh, postgraduate spiritual work just like esoteric Buddhism is, is not, you know, kind of 
regular Buddhism. Okay, esoteric Buddhism is really gets right down to dissecting, uh, dissecting your soul rather than massaging it. Okay, and uh, he knew it would never, never be uh, uh, super popular. Uh, the the Golden Dawn material, the the Hermetic sciences and things like that, always uh, were aimed at a very very small section of the uh, spiritual community. Theosophy was the first thing that uh, uh, popped up that, that had sort of a general kind of popular. Okay, and Crowley was encouraged by by uh, that the world was ready to more generally accept things like theosophy. But he knew that it was never going to be uh, of great interest to the masses. And not only that, but if what he was producing, what he was writing, what he was uh, uh, presenting would likely after his death, completely disappear. Okay, it was it, it was that fragile of a spiritual science. And he knew that he was never going to get published unless he got published by both his admirers and his enemies. Crowley's enemies kept his stuff in print for 20 years until the Beatles put Aleister Crowley on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's. I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. And it's sort of funny because the, the opening line of the first uh, cut of Sgt. Pepper's uh, mm -hmm. says... Uh, it was 20 years ago today. Sergeant Pepper taught the band to play, and that was exactly 20 years from Crowley's death. Not that, that they did that on purpose, but that's kind of how the synchronicities of magic, uh, magic work. So that's one reason he, uh, uh, he did that. Secondly, uh, Part of his esoteric teachings and his uh, and the development of his his uh, uh, magical techniques uh, concerned uh, a subject that was very uh, common in the East among Hindus among Buddhists. Okay, it was not a crazy thing, but we call it like sex magic today, okay? Uh, but in the years, Crowley was trying to, to uh, uh, translate or interpret for the Western mind uh, what these uh, sexual and tantric uh, uh, practices and, uh, the, and methods uh, were talking about and, and what... Uh, uh, what it all had to do with uh, uh, what human sexuality had to do with consciousness itself uh, in a classic Kabbalistic, you know, the wholesomeness of it, okay? Uh, it was illegal to talk about things like that. It was illegal. You could get thrown in jail for publishing, writing about that. Uh, even medical journals at the time had to be careful how they breached that subject or doctors would be thrown in jail. So Crowley thought in a way that he could kill two birds with one stone. He, uh, he said, okay, look, we, uh, this is great magic. This is big, big stuff. Uh, you could literally, uh, you know, uh, 
just your dad and mom uh, performed a, a fabulous, miraculous act of magic when they conceived you. Okay. Every, every one of us are living example of sex magic, of a sex magic ritual. And that's just the opening act because the, the uh, dynamics of consciousness that are also responsible and can be uh, exploited by that perfectly natural uh, process is really big magic. And in a, in a, a sense, it is uh, just one more expression of every kind of creative act of magic. And so he, th like uh, here in this book, Magic in Theory and Practice. Uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, this book was written to help you understand this book. Right. Okay. So for those who might just be listening to the recording, he's referring to the book Magic in Theory and Practice by Aleister Crowley. And the book that we're talking about today, The Magic of Aleister Crowley, is explaining that. So in Magic uh, uh, in Theory and Practice, which uh, a great deal of it was written uh, in the 20s uh, when Crowley and his uh, a few of his uh, uh, students were uh, uh, at Cefalu, Sicily, at the Abbey of Thelema. And uh, my teacher, uh, uh, Phyllis Seckler, her, her teacher was Jane Wolfe that uh, was with Crowley at uh, uh, Cefalu in the 20s. Um, He said he thought, well, I cannot not talk about this. It's one of the one of the greatest subjects and most important subjects in uh, in uh, magic. And those who have an ear to hear and eyes to see and are more or less grown up enough to to uh, 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 understand kind of what I'm saying. I got to write about it. But in 1923 or whenever it was that he was dictating this, uh, nobody would publish that. Not only that, that, that uh, Crowley could get arrested for being too explicit about these techniques. Today, you can go down to the, the probably right there at Banyan. You could probably, you probably have a whole a whole uh, a row of books that deal with this subject quite openly and in, in, in a very uh, adult and, and uh, wholesome way. But then you didn't. So Crowley, but what you could talk about is human sacrifice and blood. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody stuff, okay. And so probably an example would be like uh, instead of uh, the trying to describe the 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 moment, uh, the supreme moment in lovemaking where where uh, uh, the climactic moment, where uh, it is so wonderful that that you're you uniting together you're uniting with the with the opposite with with such ecstatic bliss that there is an instant there's a moment when you forget your two people and are a, are a single unit you dissolve you dissolve in ecstasy, and that ecstatic bliss uh, 
is an energy, it's a power, it's a force as real as gravity, but it's a force that is tantamount to losing your sense of separateness with the infinite. And it seems like, whoa, that's such a high state of conscience. No, pretty much everybody hits that moment <laughs> at some time in their in their life. And but that is it's a golden moment, all right. It is the golden moment, and it it can be uh, amplified and uh, and extended. And uh, but when you have dissolved your consciousness into the infinite. In a sense, you've become all. You become the one. Kether. The crown on the tree of life. And when you're everything, when you're the totality, when you're the singularity, you're capable of creating anything. Now, obviously, that's big magic. Okay, that's not a recipe where you whip up a demon, have the demon go off and, and perform some kind of act of heavy lifting for you. No, this is real life, big stuff. This is Buddha stuff. And so Crowley said that moment, I can't talk about that because people think I'm talking, you know, just being pornographic about this. I'm going to call that moment of ecstatic singularity consciousness, I'm going to call it death. And that whole act was a sacrifice. And and the, the 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 natural issue of the uh, of the bodily fluids, if you want to get right down to it, that is the that is the issue. That is the physical issue, the biological issue that is capable of creating the vessel for an incarnating soul, a baby. I'm going to call that blood. It's a sacrifice of blood. Now you see kind of what, uh, <laughs> what Crowley was saying. Oh yeah, I, I did something like that about 120 times. At least that's what my diary says that, that year. So he could talk about blood sacrifice he could talk about death he could but he couldn't talk about sex so he actually says in the uh, the chapter where he where he talks about this bloody sacrifice that's the name of the chapter the bloody sacrifice and this is the one that when you see uh, uh, you know church people on television evangelicals and stuff saying, Alistair Crowley, look what he says here. Okay, that's what he's talking about. But he actually says in the, that chapter, he says, hey, you're really going to get in trouble if you don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> you're you're, you're going to get in big trouble. Or if you're a magician that's, you know, uh, uh, selfish motives or things like that. You, this is going to blow up in your face. <laughs> so important to understand those footnotes. Yes, especially in that chapter, because the footnotes will really, if you haven't read the footnotes and you go through life thinking those thoughts, when you read the footnotes, you're going to be very embarrassed. So. I, I wanted to ask you, um, I'm jumping to chapter eight of, of the book. Um, 
which I know this is, I think this is the third edition of this book. And the first came out in 92 or 93 and was called The Magic of Thelema, right? Right, right. Now, uh, this is this question has two parts, but I first want to, you, you give an inscription at the beginning of chapter eight that says, the single supreme ritual is the attainment of the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. It is the raising of the complete man in a vertical straight line. Any deviation from this line tends to become black magic. Any other operation is black magic. If the magician needs to perform any other operation than this, it is only lawful insofar as it is a necessary preliminary to that one work. So two, two questions I have for you. The first is, what is meant by the raising of the complete man in a vertical straight line? Actually, maybe it's a three-part question. So maybe we'll start with that. What is meant by the raising of the complete man in a vertical straight line? I'm drawing you a, a diagram. Ah. I'm painting you a picture. Lovely. Okay. Uh, these these little these ten little bubbles there. Okay, uh, that's the Kabbalistic tree of life. The one at the bottom is is kind of we're we're there right now talking like this is our head, and up here is God head. Okay, uh, I'm going to number them for us: two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine. There's a nice uh, image of this in the front of this book as well. Oh, maybe I should just. <laughs> is that is that the one? Oh, did did Duquette? Uh... Oh, <laughs> yes. I've already drawn it right here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so th there they are in this uh, thoughtfully uh, included diagram. Uh, so there's us at the bottom there, or normal everyday consciousness, if you will. And up there is a, a, a Godhead itself. Now, right in the middle, number six, okay, which is the first reflection there of Kether. See how that's the reflection? Uh. Number six is um, uh, what we'd call the, the macrocosm. A and uh, actually... Um, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine are all the macrocosm. And the microcosm, the little world, the little world of consciousness is number 10. And the big world is uh, uh, the six right above there and kind of seven, but that's a, that's a little more. And the one, two, and three aren't really one, two, and three. They're just one thinking about itself. So just, I want to say for those listening, if they wanted to see this same image and follow along, they could, they could find the, the Kabbalistic tree of life. Correct. And that's right. Yeah. Just go to any old tree of life. Okay. Uh, but number six is a level of consciousness that's called uh, or associated with a, a, a spiritual event and a level of consciousness that's known as knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. That is when you actually, and I hate to use the word wake and woke and stuff, but this is the big woke, okay? This is an awakening to what you really are. All of these lower levels in a sense, are layers of sleepiness, layers of dream that we're in. And we don't really realize what and who we are as an entity until we have this level of consciousness that's represented by number six on the tree of life. This is when we discover that we are indeed a reflection of everything. 
Now, can you just put that sort of in spiritual terms? I wake up to the fact that the real me, the real me, is one and the same with the totality and singularity of the whole shebang. It's exactly what uh, uh, the character uh, in the Jesus myth is. When Jesus said, standing there in number six, I and the Father are one. When you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. And every one of us, it, when we wake up to that level, realize that. You and me, it may seem like you're in Vancouver and I'm uh, in Sacramento. Yeah. Part, our, our dream, our dream Ross and Lawn are seemingly here, but we're really talking to ourselves. And uh, it would be like, ultimately, when we finally wake up to who who and what we really are, we'd, we'll realize that we've been everybody else all along. It's like a, one of those uh, uh, physical holographic uh, lenses uh, where uh, if you would if you'd break the lens, every shard of the of the of the broken lens uh, contains a complete and whole image of the of the of the whole image, but it's from a different from a different angle, a different perspective. I don't know if I'm making that clear. You are. You are. Um, can can so I ask something, Lon? Sure. So is it? Am I right then to say that when when Crowley says the single supreme ritual is the attainment of this knowledge. All of the rituals outlined in this book and the kind of essence of Crowley's teaching is, is a non-dual teaching. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely right. And so the uh, until the magician has hit that level of six, the magician is not awake enough to know what the hell is in the magician's best interest or not. You're not awake enough to. So that's what he means. Like, well, any magic that you try to do until then is uh, uh, still bogged down in this in this dual uh, uh, illusion. And if your magic works, you're, you're lucky. But it's not going to all. <laughs> it's a hit and miss thing until until you uh, uh, actually get that spot, get that place, get that level of consciousness then you know what is and is not in your best interest. So until then, that's the single ritual that uh, uh, that Crowley calls the supreme ritual. And until you do that, all these other things are just um, uh, temporary rituals, if you will, that um, uh, fix the small little uh, imbalances and... Uh, and blockages and stuff. They're just sort of to uh, to tune you up, to squirt WD-40 lubricant in your efforts uh, to achieve that holy guardian angel. Then when you have that level of consciousness associated with number six, and oh, oh by the way, just turn around to your chakra thing in the background there. Yeah, your, your, your green Anahata chakra. When that's open, that's your holy guardian angel. Uh -huh. Once that has been fully activated and and uh, uh, assimilated, your when the self has been assimilated by that particular level of consciousness, that little sucker is just spinning away in your chest. Okay, so. Uh, uh, once you've got that level of consciousness, then the angel, and, and it helps to think of it 
as your own personal holy guardian angel that you've just married. Okay. And it's good to think of it in terms of you're no longer just you. You're a holy guardian angelized you. And that angel isn't just a holy guardian angel. That holy guardian angel is a youized holy guardian angel. You're, you're a team in one, one new improved entity that finally knows what is and is not in, in your own best interest. So the angel then, in, in uh, the metaphoric terms, the angel then becomes your guide, your counselor, to help you go on from there, to do what needs to be done next to get you to two or three and two and one, okay? Because there's another crisis after the angel, but you don't even need to worry about that until you get the angel. And so any other little detour that you would take until you get the angel, that's what Crowley's referring to as any other operation is black magic. Thank you. That That's a really, that was an uh, amazing uh illumination of that concept. Thank you. Um, uh, we, if it's okay with you, we've got some really nice questions rolling in from, from the live audience as well. Sure. Okay. There's one that, that plays off of what we were just talking about. This is a question from Caleb who says, do you think that the attributes of the tree of life are ultimately arbitrary, but allow us to have a more communal language, so to speak, about such vast concepts? Yes. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> that's, that's well said. Uh, uh, they're arbitrary, but uh, uh, it's a really good kind of mathematically perfect arbitrary arbitrariness. Okay, the the fact that uh, it's really convenient. It could be arbitrary. We could be basing it on any number. Any number and all numbers are infinite. Tree of Life has 10 because uh, uh, it's easy for us to think, well, we, because we're made in the image, in a sense, of, uh, of deity. And we conquer the universe with 10 things and 10 and yod and things like that. There's, But ultimately, yeah, it's arbitrary. And it gives us a vocabulary to explain things to ourselves and to explain things in a conversation with other people that also accept that arbitrary language. Okay. Thanks, Caleb, for that question. Um, there's another one here from uh, the, the YouTube handle is Magic Mech. And uh, Magic Mech says, did Crowley leave most of these rituals to multiple interpretation on purpose? For example, Star Sapphire made me wonder so hard when I first read it. It could be an HGA invocation uh, uh, or even tantric. Oh, I, I think uh, especially that one because of the holy, uh, holy hexagram uh, thing is the union of... Okay. Uh, Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The uh, uh, And I have a feeling that even even the, the non class A or works that uh, class A works uh, were things that Crowley uh, said, you know, I didn't really write this. It sort of came through me. Uh, but even the ones that aren't like that, uh, uh, I think Crowley on purpose said, I'm going to do whatever I can not to limit uh, the individual magician's interpretation of things. And the, the reason that, that even when he makes comments on uh, and elaborates and, and dilates on uh, the uh, details of certain uh, rituals, he still leaves a great deal of important stuff up to the individual magician 
to uh, uh, to work on and work out for them for themselves, and uh, uh, just even the blocking of a of a ritual. You know how you move around the temple and which which uh, pentagrams or hexagrams you draw and what holy divine words that you use in certain quarters. Uh, he more or less assumed that if you hadn't actually figured it out for yourself, if you had to wait for him to explain everything, that you weren't really grasping it and that, that you would be... Uh, uh, just parroting what you heard, saw, or, or, or understood uh, like an actor with a script. But if you actually looked at it hard enough, agonized over it, and said, what the hell is he talking? And, and all of a sudden, you, you go, a light bulb goes off in the top of your head. Then you've got it. Then it's yours then your use of that particular uh, uh, element or a piece of business is a magic tool. You got it. That light bulb that went off of, uh, over your head when you got it actually is an electricity <laughs> that goes into your uh, uh, execution of, of that particular piece of business. It's like It's like your magic wand is completely useless and impotent until the light bulb goes off over your head that lets you understand, oh, that's what the wand is about. It's like when that happens, it's like you've stuck your wand up into a light socket in the, <laughs> in the ceiling and it energized it like... Uh, you know, like a Marvel uh, comic book character or something. Yeah. But anyway. Thank you. And thanks, Magic Mech, for that question. Uh, there's, a, there's another one here from Queen Alexandria who says, Hey, Lon, I'm a transgender queer witch. I really admire and appreciate Crowley's work too, but a lot of my peers can't get over his reputation. Could you chime in on this, please? Sure. Boy, of, of uh, Crowley, uh, part of the time, uh, you know, uh, called himself and liked others to, to call him Alice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Crowley saw this coming. Okay. Uh, but also, uh, Crowley understandably uh, uh uh, on the surface, uh, appears to uh, to be very uh, fallow, phallus centric, you know, uh, and uh, like when you look at the Gnostic Mass, it's oh gee, the priest uh, has all the all the things, and we're always talking about about the the phallus doing this and the the the, the yoni and the phallus and everything. Now. The whole thing with Thelema is the transcendence of gender. Uh, even the, the the foundation of the of our sense of self vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the aeon that we're in. Okay, we're in the aeon of Horus. The, the aeon of Horus, which uh, in a sense is what uh, uh, differentiates Crowley's Thelemic magic from the magic of the last 2,000 years and the magic of the 4,000 years uh, uh, before that is our sense of identity, of creative identity. Two aeons ago was the age Crowley saw it conveniently labeled the age of Isis. That's where we, we uh, 
uh, mankind was at a stage, and here I use the word mankind, humans were at the stage where they weren't concerned about too much in life uh, except putting food in their bellies. That's, that's it, nourishment. Okay, and we were really into nourishment. That's all we were into, really. We weren't even sure where babies were coming from. We didn't have a nine-month attention span. We just knew that, well, we, so, do the, so do the elk, you know. Uh, nourishment was the big thing. So that was the age of Isis, okay? Uh, Isis, the, 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 the goddess that nurses, uh, nurses the baby. Nourishment was the, was the thing. And so, so everything magical uh, was based on a on a formula of nourishment. The earth, the earth nourishes us. Okay, the earth brings uh, forth the food, and uh, and uh, we eat the food. Okay, the nourishment. The woman, the woman is nourishment. Okay, she's. When, when she has a baby, she's not sure why she's having it, but it's all connected with the moon and nine moons and stuff like that. And the baby just pops out, surfs out in water, and, and she just takes that baby and plugs it right in her. And she nourishes it directly from her body, just like the earth and connected with the moon. Can you see the, the formula going on of the... Primitive pagan formula, okay? The next aeon was uh, 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 characterized by, oh, we're starting to put two and two together that the sun's really important. And here comes the phallus, okay? This is the phallus thing. The sun's penetrating rays are needed to penetrate the earth, to germinate and... and uh, uh, the, the the plants uh, uh, start to to grow from the seeds, and that uh, we finally do have a nine month attention span, and uh, uh, we know that the woman's going to remain barren unless, of course, uh, there's a uh, uh, introduction of the the, the male, and uh, then then the pendulum swings in the other direction, and we become very conscious of the sun, very conscious of the phallus, very conscious of the uh, the partnership of, of uh, sun and moon. And uh, but it freaks us out because the sun dies every day. This freaks us out. We don't know whether it's going to come up every day. So it becomes a death cult, too. But we've got that male-female thing. And both of those formulas are correct to a point. They're accurate to a point. Yes, the formula of nourishment, that works. That's ISIS, okay? The formula of the, the, the son, the father. Yeah, that works. The phallus, the yoni, phallus, okay? Now we know that the son does not die every day. And we've known it for quite a while. And enough of us have known it for so long that it has seeped into the, the very DNA of humanity. We know the sun is out there on all the time. And it's, uh, the words just spinning around this, this night thing is an illusion. And so is death. It's an illusion. Sun's on all the time. We're on all the time. And now, they move from Isis, they move from Osiris, and they move now to Horus. And Horus is twins. And here is where, and Crowley says it all over the place, this is where we are going to become no longer bound by self-identity. Self by the by the the old formulas, and so the 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 identity of 
each of us now is absolutely free to be as as fluid or as selective. Uh, this is the natural. This is the natural result of the aeon of Horus and the the formula of the aeon of Horus. It's very difficult, and Crowley makes it very difficult for most people to initially grasp that because they're thinking, well, oh, Crowley's just, he's wagging his phallus all over the place. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he's not. Horace is twins, active and passive, not identified, not bound by, by the uh, gender formula, but by the active or passive formula. And the whole, uh, the magic of active passiveness is, is more than uh, uh, magnetic polarities involved. It's, it's uh, uh, actual, the, the, the process of, uh, of uh, what we would call in hermetics anyway, the fifth element spirit. It's like that. That's spirit on the on the, uh, with with a pentagram. It transcends the polarities of uh, uh, well, it be water here and air here and fire here and earth here. For those listening, Juan is drawing the showing the pentagram and what each point represents. Okay, it's like that. Okay, now, if we move in this direction. From earth to water. Earth to water, that's passive. And if we go from this direction. Fire to air. That's active. So there's active pentagrams, passive pentagrams. Then there's banishing uh, passive, banishing actives. Going in the opposite direction. Right. And the key to it all, which is really where it's at, has transcended both of those. That spirit pentagram at the top of the, or the spirit uh, symbol here, is at the top arm of a, of a pentagram. And in order for us to do anything uh, of a complete nature, okay, we activate them all, and that's not that's not uh, binding anybody to any particular uh, 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 gender identity, except for convenience and preference at any given moment. Okay, but the active passive never. Okay, you can be you can be anything and still be activating that active passive uh, 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 thing, and the the uh, utilization, at least in technical magic, of the uh, the uh, active passive uh, uh, use of the 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 pentagram is a perfect illustration of that. The twins of Horus are the active, wild and crazy uh, Horus, the avenger of, of uh, his parents. He avenges. Okay. He's crazy. He's wild. He's positive. But there's Hor Parkrat or, or Horus. Uh, the Greeks call him Harpocrates. He's the Horus brother that doesn't say anything. He's got his fingers to his lips. He's so perfectly passive that nothing can resist him. There's nothing for an enemy's arrow to uh, find a target. He's silent. So, but they can't exist without each without each other. And so they flash 
back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. The idea of uh, of uh, the 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 character. I well, I, I got a book cover that shows a uh, Baphomet, uh, the, the Baphomet uh, uh, statue. Got one breast over here, and uh, uh, obviously a female breast that also has a phallus. Uh, but that that sphinx, if you will, represented by by that combination in the in the imagery of Baphomet, has a counterpart too in Babylon. Okay, all of that is talking about concepts that are so far up the tree of life that unless we're approaching that level of consciousness ourselves, it seems very confusing in your everyday uh, uh, conversation. But anyway, simple answer to that question, I think, is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lon. And uh, we're just coming to our time here. I want to thank our live audience, as always, for being so wonderful and, and for all of your great questions. And um, um, just a reminder, we've been speaking to Lon Milo Duquette about the third uh, edition of his now classic book, The Magic of Aleister Crowley, a handbook of the rituals of Thelema. And, and Lon, I understand uh, you have a new book coming out. I do. It's coming out. It's it's a novel. It's my accident, an accidental Christ. The story of Jesus is told by his uncle, and uh, it's coming out on June eighth. And I've got a book launch uh, thing happening here, and uh, I've I've been working on this for well over thirty years well over 30 years. Uh, oh, that magic of uh, Aleister Crowley. Uh, the new edition is the 30th year anniversary edition too. But anyway, it's a novel and it's, it, it's funny. And it uh, actually what it is, is I wanted to uh, actually have us all speculate on how, uh, how the events that we've always been uh, used to hearing as out, out, uh, outlined in the Gospels could have all happened without any supernaturalness at all being involved in it. And... Uh, in order to do it, uh, certain things have to become very funny. And there's a backstory about, uh, you know, the what kind of uh, character the that the uh, Jesus might have actually been. And it's based on new stuff because we were finding out uh, uh, more about the family and things like that uh, and certain uh, uh, realities of first century uh, uh, Palestine and, and uh, Roman politics and things like that. So uh, it, to me, it's very entertaining, but I like, I like myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. We like you too, Lon. I, I get a kick out of me, you know. So. <laughs> so. Well, we'll look forward to, to, to seeing that when it comes out June 8th. June 8th from Llewellyn Worldwide. So great. Uh, really, really appreciate your time. It's been a really delightful to, to speak with you today. Thanks so much. Well, I'm sorry. I just, I talked too much, actually. I, I, I didn't do much listening. That was our job. My, <laughs> my wife keeps telling me this. Okay. I think it's okay in this context. Oh, good. <laughs> well, thanks for giving me the opportunity.
Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.